Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Baby Friday. Uh, I um, it might take a few y'all uh, y'all a few minutes to find us over here because uh, there was seems to be a a, a little mishap with the um, posting of the session today. Somehow it changed my time um, to like eight o'clock this morning. And people that know me know I don't do nothing at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Jennifer, we might be um, speaking to uh, just your, you and I here for a while uh, if people are looking for the other broadcast. So um, that's cool with me, too. You know, I love talking to you, Betty. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, and also for those of y'all that uh, we just had Mother's Day pass this past weekend. So happy Mother's Day to all the mamas out there. Uh, I had a nice, good day spent it out on my lanai watching NASCAR in the pool. So you can't beat that for me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So I am pleased to have as my guest today, uh, Jennifer McNamara. And she is uh, now with Onco Spark. Um, and she is here to talk with me today about cardiology, uh, one of the subjects that I like a lot. As people are coming in, if you're coming in, please uh, make some comments. And let me know that y'all are here. And um, oh, we have Sarah here. Hi, Sarah. Nice to have you in. So uh, I'm thinking people then are going to be able to find us. So uh, it just may take a minute for them to kind of switch over. Uh, yes, and so I can see comments. I'm excited. I figured out how to see the comments. So I can oh, see good. <laughs> So I can follow along with you and see who's on. Uh, and we are um, uh, going to go through some of the IC10 guidelines. So we're going to talk about a couple different things. I picked hypertension because that no matter what practice, even if you're not in cardiology, of course, we see that everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, MIs. Uh, just because uh, even with the change that they made when they originally went over to ICD-10, people kind of still struggle with looking at it sometimes with the mm -hmm. subsequent and the initial and, you know, uh, if they have a subsequent after having an initial and that, you know, and how to do all that. So we'll, we'll kind of go through that a little bit. And then um, CAD, if we have a little bit of time, we're going to throw some CAD in there uh, because people get kind of um, mm -hmm. struggling with the I. Um, uh, 26 category with the CID stuff, the um, uh, looking at uh, I-25 category, sorry, with, you know, the native arteries and autologous veins and all that kind of stuff. And they, they kind of get lost in there too. Right. Um, and uh, talk about also the um, cardiology coding summit that is coming up with Anko Spark. So I mm -hmm. think that'll be some exciting stuff to all kind of throw in here in this hour. So it's kind of jam packed for everybody. So we got a lot of stuff to, to unpack here. And but starting off and you all have to excuse me. I know I'm a little nasally. My allergies had just been <laughs> killing me today. I don't it's know everywhere, what, dear. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, I woke I up either. this morning. I was just like, oh, Lord. And my medic medicine just is not enough to like take over today. So I'm very nasally and my head is stuffy and I have allergy face. So I'm going to just kind of, you know, sit further. <laughs> <laughs> you look fabulous, dear, as always. <laughs> So, thank you. Um, so first, uh, I, I want to talk to you about uh, yourself a little bit and uh, sure. let everybody that's watching kind of come in and, and get some uh, uh, little background on you that might not know you. Um, mm -hmm. And as I see, too, uh, we got some more great. We got more people coming in. Hola, Karen. Great to see you. And Kristen <laughs> and Banu. Good, good. I'm glad y'all are, are in and saying hey. Um, so, Jennifer, uh, how long have you been in the healthcare field? Well, I kind of count my education period into the healthcare, but but in the field about 20 years. So it's hard to believe like when you when you reach a 20 year period, it seems odd. And like, you're like how did I get here? Yeah, and I'm sure yeah, it's the same for the you. Decades. It's, it's like when you get to the, the second decade, you're like, wow, I've been doing this that long. And like it just sneaks up on you for sure. But yeah, 20 years is what I'll say. Great. <laughs> and and what got you interested in coding? 
Well, I kind of call it a family business because people ask me where I heard about it. And I really heard about it through my family. So my cousin um, had, when she, she's a little older than me. So when she went through this whole thing, had a high school and getting into things. And my aunt, um, her, who is also her aunt, she um, worked in administration at Whittier Presbyterian Hospital in California. And so she had been in healthcare her whole career. And so that's how we knew about it. We always knew her talk about the business of medicine, you know, through when we were younger. And so we heard about it and I was either going to go legal. Like I thought about paralegal. I thought I loved watching Perry Mason with my mom when I was a kid. And like, I just love watching lawyer shows. That was what I ended up watching. I'm like, Oh, I could do that. I could like be in the courtroom and type what they're saying and, or be the court reporter or the paralegal being with the lawyers and like doing all that. It'd be super fun. But then I'm like, oh, but working from home sounds cool. And I really also like medical shows. So that's where like my history came in and the interest, right? And then my cousin pushed me and she's like, you got to do this and you'll you'll love it. And so I did, but I didn't want to do inpatient coding. Like I, I it kind of scared me initially. I was like, um, I, I researched it and I thought, well, I'm going to stick with the physician side for now. And that's what I worked on. And over the years, I, I just never turned down an opportunity, right? Like I, I figured out, okay, I'm going to start out as a receptionist. You know, that was what I could get at the time while I was okay. still in school and uh, learning. And I had a great mentor. Um, I worked in a four person office. It was the doctor, the nurse, the lab tech, and me. <laughs> <laughs> there was just the four girls. And, and it was know, I think fun. that's the best, isn't it? It was so fun. Oh my goodness. Great experience, you know. And it was funny, like I never thought I would ever be clinical, but the lab tech, she did all the coding, you know. So she was training me, but she said, Hey, come in the lab. I want you to I want to show you how to do a do a vena puncture. I want to show you how I do the lab and I want you to try it. I want you to help me. And I'm like, You want me to take people's <laughs> blood? Like, really? <laughs> And so I was like, Shh. okay. So she sent me home with an orange and a, and a syringe and a tourniquet and whatever. She's like, get, get the feel for it, you know, so you can, I don't know. Anyway, I did it. I couldn't believe I did it. And it was actually really fun. After a few times, the patients get used to you. They're like, okay, they're new, but they're going to do this. They were very nice about it. And um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I love doing it. It was it was my one experience in my career in the, I guess, what you call the clinical side. So mm -hmm. it was definitely a good experience. And that taught me that I wanted to learn more than just coding. I wanted to learn what providers do. I wanted to work alongside them. I wanted to work I wanted to be with the patients too. So I, I kind of tried to emulate that in my career, even though I was in the business side, I really wanted to learn all that I could. And so I, I have a good relationship with the surgeons I worked with. And I, I, to this day, just really have fond memories of working with them, even being in the OR with, with one of my orthopedic surgeons at one point. So I really just enjoyed that experience that I had. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always um, stuck to, the, the profi side myself, um, you know, I, I was a, a, an x-ray tech. And so I was in the, you know, working at a hospital, but um, it was, it, I just kind of just took more to the physician side of stuff myself. So um, when things started to open up for me, it was always on the physician side. Um, when, when I told them I didn't want to do x-ray, I said, I just don't want to do it anymore. I got stories on stories about yep. that. And, and so I just had it and they stuck me at a clinic that they, that, that the hospital owned and they were like, you can pick any clinic you want. And, you know, so they stuck me at a desk with coding books and left me there for two weeks and then came back and said, okay, your training is done. You can start coding now. Um, yeah, and that was it. So I, I've got a, a little more, a decade plus on you. So it was, yes. a, it was a little before your time, but they, they didn't have coders. They didn't have classes. They didn't have, I mean, it, it was, yeah. you know, sink or swim. And um, so I've always kind of, you know, been working in with the physicians and, and uh, it just was more for me, it was like more personable you know, that one-to-one, -one, whereas with the hospital, it's the administration and this and this department yeah. and that and that. And when you're in the offices, it's like, you know, you could stop the doc. Hey, doc, blah, blah, you know, take a look at this. And what did you mean by this? And let me show you this, you know. And so it just kind of, yeah, stuck with me a little bit better on that side, too. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, and, and 
I, I was lucky enough uh, in my early part of my career that I worked at a large teaching facility um, in the um, professional fee support you know, department. And we did whatever came across our desk. So I got exposed to all special. We had over at that time, 25 years ago, we had 500 physicians. Um, that was huge back then. And so, you know, I was lucky enough to be exposed to all specialties and not get, you know, pigeonholed into just one thing, right. which me with what I do now because I can, you know, um, uh, talk about so many different specialties. Yeah. What specialties, you know, along that line, what kind of specialties do you, you know, do you like or and do you work on? Well, I like them all, honestly. Like I find them all fascinating. And one way or another, I just I went back and counted and I looked at all of them. And I've actually, in one way or another, I've touched charges, whether billing or coding or denials for every specialty. Like, I just like, how did I do that? How did I accomplish this? But, but I worked in the billing department. So like you worked as, I worked as a coding denial expert. And so I learned things and I learned a lot about coding itself from working those denials, like coding in reverse. It's like the reverse part of it. Yeah. You, you learn, I learned a lot from just doing that because I was a builder before I was a coder. So I learned that what was wrong and then I'm like, what's, how do I fix this? And then that's how I, I learned to read guidelines and figure it out. So, but as far as like my first specialty in coding was radiology, just doing those for the actual hospital, um, coding, just the, the, the diagnosis portion. And, uh, then I went into, um, orthopedics and I, I didn't really know that I was going to do that. I, I went to, I moved from one area to the other in different state. And so I needed a job as a new coder, I was newly certified. And so I went into an interview for a cardiologist office actually, um, just to do billing and, and uh, denials, which is what I knew really well. And so I, I went then and she's like, you're overqualified, you're a certified coder, you should, be, you should have a coder job. And I was like, well, that would be great. <laughs> But, um, I, I, you know, I was like, I'm here anyway. So she was my, my, uh, friend over there across the hall in the orthopedic office is looking for a coder. I'm going to send you over there. I'm going to see if you can interview with her. And I got the job in the first interview. Like, I was like, what is happening? <laughs> like, not what I expected. And ortho scared me to tell you, it, it did scare me a lot, a lot. And so, but I, it was like a sink or swim situation. Like I, I had to make it happen because this is what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I did it. I researched and I, I had great people that I could reach out to that I could ask questions to from my previous job that were still really helpful. And um, it was just great experience. Like, you know, I, I developed a huge love for orthopedics and I've been doing that most of my career now. In the meantime, though, like at our hospital, we had not many certified coders in the offices, like very few offices actually had certified coders. So if they needed a certified yeah. coder, they would come to the ones that already were certified wherever they were in the hospital, <laughs> wherever they were sitting. They would and find so you. <laughs> they found me. So the general surgery coder, she was retiring. And so they're like, we're not going to hire somebody else. We're just going to see if we can find somebody who already is in the system. So they found me and they said, hey, do you want to code general surgery too? <laughs> It's like, sure, <laughs> not going to turn it down. So that was a great experience. So, so now, you know, I, those are the two that I love is general surgery and orthopedics, my favorites. Okay. And then there's offshoots, you know, like I've been, I've done podiatry, um, with has takes in some ortho, um, and I've done neurology. I've done, um, ophthalmology as well in my career, urology, pulmonology. I mean, I've done all, all of them in one way or another, but I would say my favorites are ophthalmology, general surgery, and orthopedics. Yeah, I, I, and I will confess, um, uh, I love all of them, especially uh, dermatology and cardiology. Those are, are two of my my special, special babies. Um, but uh, anesthesia, I, I would rather get poked in the eye oh, no. with a yeah. hot stick <laughs> I know who to call for that though. Kim, it, Kim I Williams, do. she's my anesthesia expert. Because I'm like, y'all have graphs and this and that. I was like, I just can't. No, no, thank you. Uh, and orthopedics, you know, general orthopedics was never, you know, too off putting to me, but when it would get into like the hand and the, you know, feet, I was just like, okay, no, you know, so that's, you know, not one of my favorites either. Um, so I, 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 I must say, I, I probably will have to get with you at some point to get a, a few more lessons that are, you know, 
<laughs> because I just, I, it's the same way people sometimes feel about cardiology. You know, yeah. I think cardiology is fascinating, but when I would teach classes, cause I used to teach, you know, PMCC courses. Um, and right. when we do the cardiology chapter, they were just like, you know, it's so great to listen to you because you're so excited about it and yeah. you're so jazzed about it, but I never want to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's it's not you either love it or you have a desire for it, or then you're like, I'm just gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna pass my test and then never touch it again. <laughs> yeah. So so um uh so that's where we're we're kind of looking with some of these. And so cardiology though, it, it's not just the special, especially for RCD 10, it's not just the specialty that right. you see this stuff with. I mean, people see their GPs you know, for their cardiovascular stuff, if it's not, you know, to a level where they need to see a cardiologist for it. So right. even though you might not be, you know, that's not my thing, you know, it's still something that's pervasive in the entire field, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, so I also wanted to, oh, and then we got somebody else, uh, Sarah, she said the, she was, she was feeling you there saying she's been all over too. Yeah, it sounds like that song. I've been everywhere, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that song. Johnny Cash, man. Yeah, uh, love the Johnny Cash. So also, I know you uh, have a podcast. So I want you to tell everybody about your podcast because you sure. just had a new episode that dropped. I saw on LinkedIn the notice go up for it. So uh, what's that about? Well, life as a coder, you know, I, I started this back in 2020 when I broke my ankle during the pandemic and I was laid up for three months just sitting there like nothing to do. And I like to be involved in things. I don't, I'm not really a writer. I don't like write my thoughts down. I don't, not one of those people. I don't like to read necessarily for fun. So <laughs> like, um, so I thought, well, I'm going to use this time to really talk about what I want to talk about. And, um, podcasting was starting to become really more popular in the healthcare industry. At least I started to experience it more. And so, um, of course my, my dear friend, Terry Fletcher had one really, really, you know, well-known podcast. And so I would yes. listen to her, get ideas like, okay, like people want to hear these topics, but I also want to talk about work-life balance because I experienced a, a traumatic event emotionally and mentally um, at a previous employer uh, the year, a couple years before. And so it was still on my mind, like mental health was on my mind. So that was my first episode was talking about mental health in a remote role is what it was about because we were all pushed into remote work. I was already there, but most people was new for them to be pushed home and all the things that happened. So I started that way. And so I wanted to do a combination of work-life balance and then also coding topics, but also not just coding healthcare in general, the business of medicine. And so I've kind of transitioned now. I mean, coding's great, but I'm more than a coder. And I wanted people to also feel that they are more than coders. They are a piece of the cog that is the revenue cycle. And I want them to see that because if you are just in your coder role, you're not going to see how important your role is if you don't understand the other roles that are out there. So I talk about auditing, I talk about billing, claims, you know, um, the OIG, <laughs> the government. Uh, you know, OIG, that's like scary that. enough for people. So yeah. um, I, I put, here's a, a notice for everybody. Uh, and I will put it in the comments on um, on LinkedIn too. Uh, so people can click on some stuff or, oops, that's the wrong one. Oh, um, so yeah. yeah there it your is. Life yeah. as a Coder podcast. So it's every, you can go on Apple, Spotify, Android, you know, all the social media places, right? Um, yeah, uh, there's so many of those now too. Yeah, uh, I'm on Facebook. So you can I'm follow it everywhere. Uh, I, I like on Spotify because I do my Spotify, yeah. you know. So I, I I have you up um, in my listing in there, along with Sunal and Terry oh, and Sean. You know, yes. so I have all I, I have them all listed up there. Yeah, so good. Um, so I will uh, load that up in there for everybody for the other stuff too. So um, all right. So let's get into our guideline stuff. Yes. I also made a little um, presentation for everybody, uh, just three slides um, as we, when we get into talking about MIs, because mm -hmm. again, people that know me, when I talk about certain things, I always like to try to throw the anatom uh, anatomy stuff in there because I find that a lot of people 
like um, with me, you know, I was kind of thrown into coding and us old timers, uh, you know, uh, uh, we hear, we have many stories like that where this is what I was doing. And then somebody said, Hey, do this too, or Hey, you could do this or somebody quit. And they said, well, you know, uh, why don't you try it? And yeah. then, you know, that's what you're doing. Um, and so uh, I was lucky enough that I had a clinical background, but a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. that get kind of into it. Uh, and, and with some of the, um, with some of the classes that are out there too, I think some of them, that's one thing that I, you know, tell people when you're looking for a course to teach you how to be a coder, that's one of the things I think is very important is to see, do they have medical terminology and anatomy, you know, because, um, it makes the difference and it makes you better, mm -hmm. especially if you want to move into auditing and things like that. You have to be able to have those conversations with the with the physicians and other right. providers that sometimes are a little more to the clinical side. Like, you know, you, you, I'm not going to go toe to toe with a physician on what their clinical understanding yeah. of something is. <laughs> but I mean, then I can understand it better when I'm doing it or when I'm looking at a note, that kind of thing. Right. So um, I think it's very important. So when we have discussions on certain things, I also like to throw that in there for people so that they, you know, get a little um, background on it. Or if they already know, just kind of puts it in their head as we're talking about things. So um, when we go to talk about the MIs, I'm going to throw those slides up there and we can kind of talk about that kind of stuff at that point. Okay. So um, first we have... Oh, and there was one more. I saw somebody else in one more combat. Somebody joined my my happy baby Friday party there. So I just want oh, to yes. give a shout out to Shelly there with the baby Friday. Um, so I love that. All right. So first, we're going to talk about hypertension. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think with hypertension, you know, in ICD-10, you know, it, it was easier it, it, because we had less codes, of course. But, you know, that 401.9, you know, I was just like, seriously, doctor, you know, you're a cardiologist. You've been seeing this patient for 10 years. You can't tell me what kind of what kind of hypertension they have. I mean, it just it, yeah. it, it's this laziness. Let's we have to get a little bit better. You know, it's so funny so you say that because I, I almost forgot the ICD-9 codes, even though most of my career was in ICD-9. Like literally Some most of, of it. still haunt me. That's one and of them. I'm like, oh, I for even forgot what it was because I'm like, I'm all ICD-10 now. And like it, my brain just literally almost forgot some of them. Seriously. Yep. And so when, when we were making the switch over to ICD-10, it went when I was at AAPC and I was making the um, ICD-10 you know, manuals and all of the stuff that we used when we trained ICD-10 across the country. Um, everybody was all jazzed because they're like, oh, I-10, ICD-10. Oh, that's real easy. That's the hypertension code. And so then that's, I'm like, yeah, but that's not the only <laughs> hypertension code. Oh, my you goodness, have to no. move away. You know, so I-10 now is like just the dump off that people use. And I'm, I'm like, you know, y'all really, you know, there's so much more in there. Mm -hmm. And with HCCs, all the risk adjustment oh, stuff, yes. you really need to show how sick your patients are. You know, and you can um, tell too, like with risk adjustment, I'm just going to throw this in there. The one thing when I'm teaching risk adjustment that I'm like, okay, think about this. Now we can't tell the visit. We can't make things up. Obviously they have to tell right. us, but we can, we can notice things and bring it to their attention, obviously. But if they have a certain device ordered or they have a certain medication that they're monitoring and you say a super generic diagnosis, it's a red flag because we know they have this medication they're on obviously for a reason, right? There has to be right. something else there. Yeah. And so we're not, we're not trained clinicians in that way, but we know things. Right. <laughs> we understand. These I things. know things. I like I know <laughs> things. And I'm going to tell you what I know. You tell me what you know, and let's put it together. <laughs> So, yeah, so so with, with the hypertension, it's just, um, you know, they have the same concepts that they had 9-9, you know, so we have the combos, you know, and that makes it easier, you know, but, you know, with it too, it's also not just the combo. Mm -hmm. So I also get that where they just want to do the one I-11 and then just be done. Well, you know, it's important in cardiology 
to always look at until you're familiar. And even then after that, I always go to my books. And yes, I'm old school. I don't go and use it on the computer. I have to have my book. Same girl. Right here. here. <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm an old school book girl. Yeah. So when you look at it, you know, there, there's in the section, there's all a lot of it in here that you have to keep looking at because it'll have use additional codes and code also and gives mm -hmm. you sequencing guidelines. Right. It, it, there's a lot in the hypertension section, you know, and I-11 starts it off if they have hypertension with heart disease. So you've got your I-11 category. You have either 0 0.0 that is for uh, with, with heart failure and then 0.9 without heart failure. So you want to mm -hmm. have that in first. Right. So now if you have heart failure, that's when you also need to go over to your I-50 mm -hmm. category and put what kind of heart failure. Yes, and then please. it gets into, is it acute? Is it chronic? Is it acute on chronic? Is it systolic? Is it diastolic? And, you know, I'm thinking this now, Jennifer, maybe that's why people don't like cardiology. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's probably true. Well, and like, um, you just got to keep going. The ejection fraction too. As like, I think people don't get that. Like, your your physician language leads you there, but those inclusion notes are so important, and people just think, oh, it doesn't say that in the index. Yeah, but when you get to your inclusion notes, it gives you the ejection fraction, um, and that's in the note, so it can confirm for you right. that you have the right one. So it's those things also can be looked at because. They may not say it, but they documented that ejection fraction. And that's that's in the book. Yep. Yep. So, you know, when we start here, so this is your first combo there. So remember, yeah. it takes two codes. It's a combo that combines hypertension and heart disease. And then if they have heart failure, you're going to have an additional code. So, you know, and then we move into next hypertension with CKD. Yes. So now on top of that, you got to go to your N18 category. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because with the heart failure one, they don't so much for some reason when I tell them about the I-50 code, people are just like, okay. But when I do, and I don't know if you find this too, when I talk about hypertension with CKD, they're like, but why do I need the N18? It already says CKD. Well, <laughs> the other code also says heart disease, but you have to, you know, but here... It's just like because you have to say what stage. Yeah, you know, it's, so very, it's, it's very it's relevant. Looking at just getting more specificity into what you're telling people. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, so there we go into I-12, right? Mm -hmm. And same thing, you know, when you look at the, you know, it'll have the stage five. And I think this is why, because of the specificity and the combo, like I-12, looking at my book here, I-12.0 is with stage five chronic or end stage. Mm -hmm. And so people are like, well, then why do you need the other code? Well, because you don't know whether it's stage five or end stage. You have right, to tell exactly. And that's what the additional code is going to do. You know, same thing when it says stages one through four. Well, which stage is it? The N18 tells you. And I like to say, too, you know, if you think of it from, you know, we're data reporting. We're abstracting data and the data is going to the insurance company. And they have a whole list of things that, that they know about that patient from other providers that have sent information in. So they need to know all these pieces and how they fit together. So if they order treatment down the road, they're going to know it's in relation to this, sta this specific stage of CKD they have. So they have stage three, stage four, stage five. They're real, from a clinical standpoint, that provider that they see maybe next is going to know that they have this. It's going to be documented. But the insurance company is also going to know if they order something. It's maybe not going to fly with them because like, well, you you just gave me unspecified CKD. Why are you ordering this? There doesn't seem any be medical necessity here for this. So. Yeah. It's all in the data. Yep. And it's all about medical necessity these days, too. It really well, always right? should have been, but. <laughs> uh, well, yes. But but now, I mean, that they're, they're getting pushed. a little bit more stickly, you know, they are. It. Uh, in the past, you know, we were all about CPT, you know. RV used. Um, <laughs> and, and because that's how they got paid. They didn't mm -hmm. look at ICD-10 as something that got them paid. Well, now. You know, it's something that's getting them paid right. Pay attention, you know? so, guys. <laughs> yeah, we got to pay attention to ICD-10. Uh, and then we have our super combo, uh, which is 
hypertension, CKD, and heart disease. So now you've got the trifecta, right? So we have I-13. And so when you think about it, it's nice that they do this so that you don't have to do four different codes and five different codes. Think of how many you would have to do if they didn't have the bundles for us. So, you know, they put it all together. We have the I-13. And then again, if they have CKD, we need to do the N18. If they have heart failure, we need to do the I-50. So it doesn't mean that the I-13 and you're done. You still have the other stuff coming along with it. But, you know, it, it bundles it all together in there for you. And I wanted to point this out. I forgot to mention it back on my other slide or other mention of the heart failure one, because the one without heart failure, uh, I think some people forget to look at the guidelines. There's a range of codes that are in the guidelines. So if your condition with hypertension falls into those code ranges, then that's the ones without heart failure. You still get the combo with those conditions. So I wanna make sure people remember, it's not just heart failure. If they don't have heart failure, they have these other conditions in those categories to make sure to use the I-11. Yes, definitely. Yeah, they have, uh, the categories from I-50 or I-51.4 to 7, I-51.89, I-51.9 that mm-hmm. say that they're due to hypertension. So, yeah, it's a good thing. And and before my that is, I just like this. I So I, I wanted to put this one up for Anne. She says she's <laughs> in the coding house. So I love it. <laughs> hey, Anne, welcome, welcome. Glad to have you with us. <laughs> All right. And then um, also in the guidelines for hypertension, they talk about secondary hypertension, mm-hmm. which is hypertension that's you know caused by something else instead of hypertension causing something else. Yeah. Uh, and so with that, um, just remember that, you know, they, they want you to identify what that underlying condition is. So what is causing it? Uh, yeah. So we're going to have, again, two codes in that scenario. But here, um, the order is driven by why the patient presents. I call it driver. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's when I would teach it. I always tell people because, you know, sometimes you would see that there would be three, four, five diagnoses that the physician is seeing a patient for. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, first of all, look to your code book to see if there's a rule about it has to go in this order. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's something for people that are, are, are watching or know people that are getting ready to take their CPC or other exams. That's always something to pay attention to on the exams is they will question you on making sure you understand the order. You'll see answers that you go, Oh, those are the same. No, no, they're not. Look at the order of the codes order matters sometimes in coding. And in this case, they say it's, you know, the driver, what drove you in to be seen today? What was the main reason for the encounter? That's going to be the ICD-10 that takes precedence. Absolutely. So with secondary hypertension, that's what you look at. Are they being seen for the hypertension or are they being seen for the underlying condition? And that's what you leave with. Right, exactly. And then they have the transient hypertension or white coat syndrome. We always call it too, right? Mm-hmm. Cause you have the patients that would come in and they, you take their blood pressure to be elevated and they would say, I swear <laughs> it is not like this at home when I take it. It's always <laughs> normal. You know, um, or you have a patient that um, uh, my husband, Oh, he went to have an appointment down here and um, they wanted to have some labs he went to, and the lab was right outside where the clinic was, right? So he goes to the lab. The lab is lined up out the door with chairs. And my husband like, oh, uh-uh, no, not happening. So then he goes in to the thing, and he's, I'll, I'll go back and do it later. Well, he sits down in the waiting room, and they forgot about him. And he oh, sat there for oh 45 minutes. And he says, everybody that was there when I was there had gone and a new cycle of people had come. So I was like, something's not right here. <laughs> so he went up and said, uh, it turns out they, they had somehow marked him as not there or canceled or something. And so uh, by the time he got back to see the physician, it was even longer. And so by the time, then they came in and they were just like, hmm, your blood pressure is a little elevated. <laughs> you just, well, you like, think? You think? So, you know, so there are things that happen where you might be upset. You might have teenagers, you know, and then, you know, you have a story. Yeah. Not for me, but yeah. 
So, uh, but you don't have the diagnosis of hypertension. So if you don't have that, R03.0 is how you designate the transient hypertension. That They just have elevated blood pressure. Right, right, exactly. And I'm sure people listening have more of those stories too. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, documentation is, it's funny. Like when you think, I, I think back about all the ones that, that I've seen over the years back when we had paper charts too. I mean, like I learned to audit on a paper chart. I remember neurology was my first specialty um, that I learned to audit and it was crazy. The chicken scratch that I saw and the nurse that taught me how to code on audit, she could pick things out. I could not pick out, but at the end of the day, we're like, you know, she would have to make the call and be like, if the payer can't recognize this, even if I can, can the, can the auditor at the payer do this? Are they going to kick it out because it's not legible? Like those are things we dealt with on a regular yep. basis. We couldn't figure out what they're trying to say. Yep. Yeah, you get it. And I'd say it looks like a kid drawing the ocean, you know, <laughs> when they would do that. You you would, <sighs> and it was funny because you would get into the offices, um, uh, and the people that worked in that office, they would be able to read the chart to you, you know. But yeah. I'm like, yeah, you see that mess every day. You know, so yeah, you understand how they're writing it and what they're writing. I said, but you have to think of it from externally as an outside auditor who doesn't have a relation and they're not going to make any great strides. You know, you're just another chart to them. It's not somebody that you've worked with for 30 years and blah, blah, blah. You know, they're like, no, I can't read that. You know, exactly. so yeah, but those were fun days. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we also have um, rounded out our hypertension uh, with the hypertensive crisis. That was the newer, I think that's been the newest one, I think, in this section that's been added. And it's yeah. been there for a little bit now. But um, that's when their blood pressure is greater than 180 over 120. Mm-hmm. Um, so they have category I-16 for that. And then a code from category I-10 through I-15 um, to show if the patient also has hypertension. Um, the order being driven again by the reason for their encounter. It's probably going to be the crisis. You know, if they're in hypertensive crisis, that's probably the reason why you're seeing them. there, usually. So, um, but with hypertensive crisis and urgency is how the codes break down. So I get this question a lot. So I just wanted to throw uh, a couple slides up for that, that um, the code I-16.0, hypertensive urgency, Urgency is when their blood pressure is extremely high that, you know, over 180 or over 120 in the diastolic, but there's not organ damage yet. And then hypertensive emergency is when their blood pressure is in that range, but it has caused organ damage. So that's the difference when, you know, you look, I know, you know, from a coder standpoint, we look for the physician to make the statement of hypertensive urgency or hypertensive crisis. But just so people know that this is what it means, this is what it's equating to. Yeah, I mean, we Um, don't make those judgment calls, but it's important for us to know what it means. Yes, because you may see where the physician has mentioned some kind of organ damage and then but puts down hypertensive urgency. So then you can go back and say, doc, you know, is that really what you meant? I see that you put it had organ damage here, you know, uh, yeah, and then have that discussion with them. Um, but while we were chatting before uh, we got online here, um, you also were making a, a good point about with the hypertensive crisis codes and the issue with the uh, hypertensive uh, additional code. Mm-hmm. Do you remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I wasn't sure if you were going to mention or not, but no, yeah, it was interesting to me because, you know, people wonder, they've asked me, well, why do I have to put I-10 or the other hypertension combo codes with the I-16? Doesn't that identify hypertension already? And then they were making the connection that that you can have it without having hypertension. So you have to document everything that is relevant. I mean, you have to report everything that's documented that's relevant, obviously. But yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, you can have this without having hypertension. Okay. All right. Now we're going to uh, move into our MI. So I thought Mm -hmm. I would bring up uh, the little PowerPoint slides I made up. Images are great. It helps. I know. I'm a a, a very visual person. Yes, I love Um, that. So what I wanted to put on here, just just generally, 
uh, because we're going to talk about myocardial infarction, which is heart attacks, of course, um, is that uh, when you see this cut out of the heart, you see how down in the lower area here in the left, left ventricle, that's the thickest walls that we have in the heart because it has to do that harder job of, you know, pushing up the blood into the aorta to get out to the body. So um, with it, with the heart itself, it has <clears throat> three uh, layers that make up the musculature of the heart. So you have the epicardium, epi being on top, and then we have the myocardium, which is in the middle, and that's the muscular middle wall of the heart. Uh, and then um, it, that enables the heart to contract that, that myocardium, the middle one. And then we have the endocardium, which is the innermost layer uh, that has uh, endothelial cells in it and um, connective tissue. And uh, it, it sits over um, the heart valves and it's in... Um, continuity in with the uh, endothelium of the blood vessels. So, you know, you, you've got the three layers that kind of go through there. And so when a myocardial infarction happens, um, we're looking at how far through that musculature, how far through those layers did that death occur? Right. How much tissue? So, and looking at this slide, you know, this shows you what the coronary arteries are. Um, you know, and uh, with the coronary arteries, um, looking at the um, myocardial infarction codes is asking you about the walls. And when you do uh, something else you mentioned, Jen, when we were talking before, too, was with PCIs, mm -hmm. you have you have the modifiers, right? The LD, the LD mm -hmm. that are denoting these coronary arteries so they know what they're working on. <clears throat> so with the MIs, we have STEMIs and we have NSTEMIs. So we have ST elevated myocardial infarctions and non ST elevated myocardial infarctions. Um, they'll also call them transmural and non transmural. So when it's transmural, that means it's gone all the way through. And the STEMI is denoting that too, that it's total occlusion of a major artery. So yeah. um, transmitting what, through. Yes. And then what happens, you know, when you look at the coronary arteries here, you know, the coronary artery will get all gunked up with, you know, CAD from, from coronary artery disease, plaque and all that kind mm -hmm. of junk. And so it kills off. It's blocked up to where the, the blood supply gets cut off. Mm -hmm. And just like anything else in our body, if you cut off the blood supply totally, it's going to die. Right. Yeah. The stuff. And so with an MI, it's not where the total occlusion actually happened, where the damage occurred. The damage occurs downwind, you know. So when you look at the um, the, the graph that's on your um, uh, screen, that's where they get that that name of the Widowmaker uh, from the left anterior descending. Because when damage mm -hmm. occurs in that one, it goes down and kills off that sitting around the left ventricle, yeah. which is the one that has that harder job. So that's that's the, the, the ones where they call them that because most patients, if they don't catch them, um, you know, they, they they don't survive them. Yeah. Um, so when you look at these, that's where where you're looking at how. The, the damage occurs. So when the MI occurs, it blocks it off. It, it totally occludes it or can partially occlude it. If it's an end STEMI, it's partially occluded or it's a total occlusion of a lesser artery. Um, then everything below it just dies off. And in the heart muscle, once it's dead, it's dead. You don't get right. that back. You know, um, so that's what's happening when patients have myocardial infarctions. Exactly. Yeah. And I find it so fascinating, like you, you know, it wasn't a specialty that I did every day, but when I got a chance to experience it, when I was doing evaluation and management, uh, I was helping out that that particular uh, clinic would get caught up on their ENMs. I found it fascinating just to read the documentation. And that's how I learned about anatomy even more. Like I knew it, but not as well until I dug in and read all the notes and I connected the, the dots between what they have and what they're doing for the patient. And that helped me understand it better. Yeah. 
And then I just put this one up um, to give out the different types because now when we look at the, the STEMI and the NSTEMI codes, uh, they do have ones for other specific types. So they go into the type 4A and 4B and 2. So I just made one here that shows what Great. the different types are so that you can refer to it to see what they're meaning by that or if the physician is using that verbiage that uh, it matches up to the specific type for MIs. Right. And, you know, it's been used in the industry, but just not from a coding standpoint. So it's just newer from the coders, but the physicians and, and, you know, other providers, this is uh, the way that they would be referencing them too. So it's right. just now there's a way to, you know, denote that in a code. Yeah. And we have the guideline on it too. I mean, the guidelines are specific on yep. what we should do for other types of MIs. And they even mention like types three, four, a, and so forth use this code, this code category. Yep. So now, if you didn't know, you know, you've got the stuff to match it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, while we're on the slides before we hit the MI, and I'll come back up and put this back up again later. This is a QR code because I want to make sure that we don't forget to mention this. Um, you know, all of the stuff that we're talking about today um, uh, that where you are now with OncoSpark. Uh, Y'all are having a cardiology coding summit that's yes. coming up um, very soon, right? Yes, very soon, May 21st and 22nd, virtually. So I'll put up a, uh, and this is the, here's a um, thing for that. And I will put the link here into the chat box on LinkedIn for y'all. And this is a QR code that Jennifer made up and sent to me. And Jennifer, um, I, I, I just rightfully admit that, you know, I'm just a, a an old bug and I don't understand <laughs> how these QR thingies mean. You know, I don't I understand don't know the technology do, myself. So I just know that I just point explain. my camera. <laughs> I point my camera at the code and it pulls up the website. <laughs> so that's how I know. Because some things aren't clickable, you know, like we can't click on the link that you're sending right there. So right. like for me, like I'm if I'm doing a presentation and they can't click on the links in my slide but I want them to actually be able to get there quickly. Just say, pull up your camera, scan it, and it's it's done. You're there. <laughs> so they scan this on their camera. Yeah, and it, it'll pop up a little window that says go to this link, and then it takes them there on their phone, or and um, they can see it. So it's okay. pretty cool. <laughs> fancy, fancy, I know. <laughs> I am telling you, I'm just, I'm too old for some of this stuff. I'm like, I don't understand it. Uh, but I will put the, the, the other bubble that I just had up, I am going to cut and paste it right into the stream for LinkedIn there. So, and I'm really excited about your presentation, Betty, like I oh, love yeah. E&M and you are my E&M go-to when it comes to the way you explain things in E&M. I love teaching it, but I learned so much from you, I have to tell you. So when it comes to this conference, guys, I mean, like if you need E&M help for cardiology, you definitely want to be there. And of course, our keynote speaker definitely is Tara Fletcher. Um, we consider her the, um, oh. the, the cardiology expert among experts. So yes. you definitely don't want to miss that. But I'm excited just to be there and learn from you guys and then also just to be a part of it and have the privilege of hosting this because I feel privileged that I get get to do this for people. Yeah. Yeah. I I I uh I really enjoy doing it. like I um you know E and M is just uh uh no matter how many times you talk about it, you get something different okay. and you get a different question, you get different, you know, so um, it, it's, it's just really super cool. Uh, mm -hmm. and all the changes that we're going to be seeing next year. So yes. it's like strapping oh, on so because it's not going away. Um, I'm sorry. And, I'm sorry. I know. I know. Uh, and so as we start to talk about the MIs here, if y'all have questions, you want to start loading them up into the comments so we can start addressing stuff. Yes. Um, but as far as the MIs go, as I said, you had the STEMIs and you have the NSTEMIs. And when they talk about STEMIs, um, uh, the ST elevation and the non S, they're talking about from the EKG. And that was another question. I was like, well, I don't even understand, you know, um, where they're getting that from. So, you know, when you're looking at EKG, you have the QRST, you know, they have the waves that come. Right. And that's what they're referencing here with STEMI. It's an ST elevated myocardial infarction. So when they look at the EKG, that's what they're seeing. And that is showing the depth of the destruction 
that the MI has done. So that's where that comes from. So um, when we're looking at the STEMI codes, uh, the type ones, they're I-21.0 through I-21.2 and I-21.3, you know, and when you look at your book, you know, they're all identified by the site. Now they're starting to talk about those walls that we were talking about before, you know, uh, and they have the type ones and the type twos, and then they have it, you know, what is the wall? Is it the, um, you know, uh, left circumflex? Is it, you know, so back to when I had the coronary arteries up, you know, that's what you're wanting to look at is what the site was of where the MI occurred. So um, you don't just have to rely on just it's an MI. You know, they want specific information. And when they go in to get PCIs, you know, when they have to get those interventions done to assist it, then right. those things start to match up. And exactly. it makes sense. They should. Then. They should. You know, and that's what you're looking for. So, you know, we need the complete information. So um, that's what we're looking at with the STEMIs. And yeah. the thing with the STEMIs that, that I think people struggle the most with, or the MIs in general, is this initial versus subsequent thing. Right. And, um, All the time. It's not, it's, it's not so much the the subsequent, it's the, just the whole idea of what they're talking about. You know, we used to have the 12 week rule back in the ICD nine days. Oh, yes. But it's then so they nice to change that. Then they came out with this four week rule in, in ICD 10. So how you tell if it's initial or subsequent or how you're looking at the things, it plays off of this four week rule. So the four week rule on when you're going to even code it as an MI is, is that four weeks. So if the MI is equal to or less than four weeks, and then you continue to use your I-21 category of codes. But after that four weeks is over, then you can't code it anymore. Even if they're still receiving care for it, right. you have to move into aftercare codes. Mm -hmm. So that's how they change that. And that's kind of hard for some people because they're just like, that just doesn't, I said, you know, I, I didn't make the book. I didn't make the rules. You, you just have to way. understand what they are and apply them. You know, right. so we don't agree with all of them, but you need to know what they are. So, so true. When, I, yeah. When the doctor says that's stupid, you could say, I don't disagree <laughs> I agree with, with you, you, you know, but this is what the rule is. So I'm telling you what it is. We have to. You want to get paid. Work. Exactly. Then we, and you're in your insurance and you see a patient who has insurance and they don't want to pay you cash. They want to use their insurance. You want to get paid somehow, right? They need it. So yep. we got to fall in line. <laughs> So that, that falls into this subsequent thing. So how you use these subsequents is if the patient is in that four week. So here, let me, in fact, we will use our guidelines. Absolutely, ma'am. Yes. So what they say. So if the patient is had suffered from a type one already, so they've had They've had an, a, an MI already and they have a new one within that four week time period. Still from current. The initial one. Still current, but it's now another one. Yeah. Then we go to subsequent. Right. So, and that happens. It doesn't happen a lot, um, honestly, but it does happen. And usually it'll happen within the first couple of days. So usually you're not at the third or, you know, end of the fourth week and then they're having another one. Usually they have one and then they're going to have another. So uh, usually they're pretty quick in succession when they do it. So and it doesn't have to be the same wall. It can be uh, or the same site or the same coronary artery. It could be, you know, the right coronary. And now there was damage in the other one. But now that that one's dead, now it's putting pressure on the other one that's already in bad shape. And now that one has a problem and you have another one. So, yeah. you know, you have to be specific and start watching the mm -hmm. sites for these and make sure that you're denoting that when you're using these I-22 codes. Uh, and also when you use an I-22, you have to use an I-21 well, yeah. because think about it, it's subsequent, right? So that means it has to match with something else. There has to be an initial so when you use an I-22, you have to also use an I-21. 
<clears throat> and I wanted to point out too, um, I get a lot of questions, especially since I teach the um, inpatient coding, mm -hmm. or I, I, sh I, I call it that, but the CCS exam is really not just inpatient. It, it covers everything, but most people call it the inpatient exam because you cover PCS, yeah. but, but they do focus on the guidelines for inpatient coders when it comes to ICD-10. So on a facility level and, the, and they're admitted and you're coding for the hospital, I get this question a lot. Well, how do I know what if it happened the same during the same admission? What if they had an MI and then they have another one while they're still there at the hospital? And mm -hmm. so I say, you know, think about your guideline. You know, what what is a, we could bill by the whole stay, right? And our primary or our main diagnosis, our principal diagnosis is what caused the admission. So you got to think about that. So you we think things differently in profi than we have to in patient side. So I like to point Definitely. that out. The guidelines are different. Like you have you have different categories or different um, sections of ICD-10 guidelines, right? And so you have to know my coding as an inpatient coder. I'm going to follow this particular rule. But if I'm profi and I'm doing outpatient guidelines, then I have to follow these rules. Um, mm -hmm. But we all follow the special this the chapter specific guidelines. It's just which order they go in sometimes is dictated by where they are in the hospital. Yep. So I just wanted to clear that up. And I know it's clear as much to some of you, but but uh, but I just like to point that out because it's important, even if you're just a profi coder, if you can try to learn a little bit about what inpatient coders, how they view the documentation, um, it'll help you as a whole understand the revenue cycle. Yeah. You know, that would be uh, <clears throat> a good um, a good another broadcast to do. Uh, well, I'll be talking about the conference too, because my presentation at the conference, uh, the summit is on ICD-10 and I, I am going to do both. I'm going to talk about um, the principal diagnosis and examples in cardiology, but then I'm also going to, of course, just go over the guidelines. But but I want people to know that there's a huge importance in understanding um, ICD-10 at the, the facility level. Yeah. Uh, and then we just have old MI. You yes, know, I-25.2. So old there is no mind. history of MI. Um, you know, so there's not a Z code. Uh, if they have a history of MI and that's what you see documented, you know, you're going to go to the I-25.2. Right. Um, and, you know, that is the same as we had. I mean, it was a different code, but it was the same concept in ICD-9. So that's not anything different either. And then... Um, let me see my comments. Uh, oh, thank you, Charmaine. I love Char. You know, we had the yeah. cardiology conference in 2020 with Terry Fletcher. She was one of our attendees, and I, I just love that she that she supports Terry and, and all of us because she's a great support. She is. She's nice. Um, and then uh, just the other thing would be the the CAD. I wanted to just touch on that real quick because we have a couple yeah. minutes left. Um, with the I-25 coding, because I get a lot of people that are just like, oh my gosh, there's just so much in no. those codes. And they go on and on. Because once again, it's like, you know, I could just do that one. I'm like, no, no, I no, just want to no. do I-25-10 and move on. <laughs> <laughs> you got to look at all of it. <laughs> so much easier. <laughs> so with that one, you know, you're looking at the location. So here they, they bring in... Uh, is it a native coronary artery? Is it a bypass graft that has the um, uh, the disease in it? Is it autologous vein? Is it autologous artery? Is it, you know, like, what is it? Because what happens with, with, which I find, you know, the one thing I found fascinating with cardiology was when we're talking about cabbages, right? When they're doing all the bypasses okay. and um, they're not fixing anything. They're not curing anything when they do a cabbage. You know, it, it's that thing of, you know, it's all fucked it. up. We can't, they tried to roto rooter it, you know, when they, when they try to do that. Roto -rooter it out. We, oh, and that's what it sounds like too. It does, like, yeah. Yeah, I was like, ooh. But yeah, they tried to <laughs> roto rooter, didn't do it. They've tried medication, they've tried, you know, so, well, then we'll just go around it, right? We're just going to so bypass it. They just bypass around. it. So when they do that, though, it doesn't make that go away. And so that's why a lot of times you see patients that have had cabbages come and have more cabbages. 
Yeah, I think about like an accident on the freeway, you know, like, you know that you have to take a detour because you can't get through that road or if there's a flood, if it's flooding, you can't go that way. That flood is still there. Yep. (laughs) That accident is still there, but you have to go around it. Yep. So a lot of times when patients cabbages, not only does the disease end up continuing, but it also gets into the bypass grafts. So now those are getting gunked up. So that's why they've had these expansions in the codes, because it's showing that, again, progression of disease and how complex and how critical that patient is that you're seeing. So it's important that you go through and and look at all of those codes that are in that section. You know, so uh, on top of what it is, you know, what's having it, it, then we have the angina with it or angina. If you say it that way, I have trouble saying this. <laughs> so if, if you're, where you live, you might say it differently. <laughs> that's very true. With the angina, um, do they have it with or without? And do they have it with a documented spasm? You know, so that's another piece that adds on to the CAD. Um, and also too, people may call it ASHD. So you may see it that way instead, atherosclerotic heart disease. So you also see that little name thing mentioned. And I had somebody before saying, you know, well, I never see that. I see ASHD all the time. I said, well, it's, you know, it's the same thing. It's going to your, your book will take you there. Potato, you potato, you know, the <laughs> the language will get you there. And um, I wanted to point out too, 2023, the new, the new proposed, there's new proposed code that is refractory. In China. <laughs> so they're adding more, more words to us, more Yay. codes to describe more things. So, we'll and that's something else you're going to talk about at the summit, right? In your session. Yes. I mean, I did a, I did a webinar pre, uh, um, on it briefly, but I'm going to talk about more detail because I, I wanted to really hone in on the cardiology part. Um, I could in my other webinar, I couldn't do it because it was on everything, but yeah. I'm going to really like focus on the, the cardiology specific. There were some new codes coming um, new, and I was excited about the ventricular tachycardia one. Like I was so excited. I hope that because these are proposed, you know, we won't know until it actually fully comes out, but I'm like, please keep it in there. I really hope that stays because I want to tell you one thing that when I was coding for one of some of the procedures and we look at LCD policies, um, they're very specific in cardiology. If you're not looking at your LCD policies, they're lengthy. It takes time to read those things. And so some of them will say wording that are very specific. And so an auditor came back at me one time and said, well, you, you can't code this because it, it wasn't, it didn't say this in the note. And I said, well, I'm going to go back at you a little bit here. Did you use the physician language? The physician language took me in the, my index to the same code that I just coded. And it's because there wasn't another code for a specific wording of that type of uh, tachycardia. Um, and so now they have further given us more codes now to further clarify that so we can hopefully have this issue resolved if the insurance company gets this code now they're going to be like okay yeah it falls here because the one code it had no inclusion notes it just had one code for all of it and i'm like there's more to it than this we have to have another code so i'm super happy good good yeah so yeah just remember with with cardiology as far as i see tin goes um you know specificity is is super super important Um, you know, and, and yeah, it's nice to be able to use, you know, a one code and be done, but that's not, that's not not reality. You know, um, (laughs) you really need to show what's going on and, and it takes a little work. It takes a little looking, it takes a little time and patience, you know, um, but it's a great specialty. Um, you didn't uh, pay for it. That's what your job is, right? Yeah. You need to be careful and, and be specific. So, uh, and I wanted to um, just throw up here for uh, those of y'all that are stumbled upon me on LinkedIn for this, that, um, you know, you can uh, go to LinkedIn and follow me to um, make sure you get notices when we're doing more of these, because I do them every other week. Um, You know, I'm considering doing them every week, but, but to be honest with you, I'm run, you know, I, sometimes I, I'm like, I don't know what to talk about this. I know, sometimes <laughs> so I think, do you have my podcast? podcast? I'm like, 
give me ideas, guys, because I'm running out sometimes. Then I like, okay, I'm going to just pick a basic topic. 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about EOBs. Like, I don't even know like, what I'm going to yeah. talk about today. Yep. So I'm always open for suggestions. Yeah. So, you know, load it up and let me know what your suggestions are for future things. And, and uh, we'll make sure that, that uh, we get them done. Um, Absolutely. But uh, I, I wanted to uh, thank you, Jennifer, very much for being my guest today. I'm honored. Uh, this honored. has been a lot of fun. And don't forget about, again, the Cardiology Coding Summit. Uh, yes. May 21st and 22nd. We and I did there. load it up in there. So you can go and hit the link now in the comment section um, instead of, you know, not being able to do it on the screen, of course. So now you have that to be able to go check it out. And it'll be me and Jennifer and Terry Fletcher and Christine Hall and Stacey, Stacey Buck. Buck. Yeah. You know, so we've got uh, we've got a lineup of heavy you got, hitters. You got the dream team, guys. Yeah. Now, I want to say I am most excited to, I mean, like, Terry is going to do a lunch presentation on telehealth for cardiology, guys. Telehealth mm. is still a problem. It's it's not it, it's I don't I don't think people get it, and it, it changes so quickly that it's hard to just like you don't know from one minute to the next what you're doing. But every specialty needs to know what what they need to know for their specialty, and so it's going to be a great thing. So if you attend, it's worth it alone the ticket price just to listen to Terry talk about telehealth. <laughs> it's like she's I love the way she explains it. So. It'll be great. Uh, so please, please come and enjoy the fun with us. And is um, Jordan going to do one of his Yeah, you know, Jordan likes data. data. We all know that Jordan likes data. And so, yeah, he's going to be on talking about, you know, obviously from a business standpoint, we understand our data. Our data tells us a lot, which is what we do. Like we're data abstractors for the government guys. We track diseases by report by reporting the codes correctly. We're helping track future disease trends, current disease trends, and helping patients get better access to care. So, I mean, like, our job is so important. So, yeah. it's so important. We have to do it right. Yep. Good. Well, yes. good, good, good. Thank you. And, Thank you. and um, I'll be uh, seeing everybody that goes to the uh, Cardiology Coding Summit. We'll, we'll be talking. I'll be talking e &M there. So mm -hmm. if you got some E&M stuff for me, uh, make sure you come and ask me your questions. Yes. And uh, we will be seeing you on another episode soon. I'm getting a lot of thank yous from people. So yes. um, I'll put a couple of them. So Sarah... You're quite welcome. And Barbara thought we were funny. She thinks we're funny. Yeah, we, we're yes. funny. Yeah, we have yes. some moments. Sometimes we try. Oh, and Sharon's on. Hey, Sharon. Oh, yes, Sharon. I got you. Oh, I got she's you. She's asking about the CEUs for, for the summit. 15. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's that's ortho. I'm sorry. 12. Oh, still good. Sorry. That's still a, and I that's over two days. days. There. No, 15 for ortho. I get confused. No, we have 12. <laughs> <laughs> yes 12 great well great great, great question sharon and, and and good to see you uh that you're watching i, I love sharon so much she's she's, oh, she's one of my favorites at healthcon uh, i loved her presentation so yeah good. yeah i'll have to have her on again we'll have to do something else uh, all host. right y'all have a good day have a good you weekend too. good to see, see you, you see you again soon bye thanks